I suppose if there is an area that arouses anxiety in parents as much as any other, it is this area having to do with the with sex. And uh, so I'm happy to spend a little time on this subject. Now I think uh, I want to first of all make it clear what I'm talking about. When you're filling out an application blank and it says sex on there, <laughs> how do you answer it? <clears throat> do you answer it yes or no? No, you answer it male or female. And so what we're talking about then is our, our not the, just the physical relationship. That's not what I have in mind when I talk about sex education. But what I mean is the attitude that an individual has toward humanity. In this world, there's about 50% of us that are women and the other half of us, roughly, are men. Well, the question is, what are women like? Sometimes people want to lump everybody together and say, that's the way women are. Now, what is your attitude toward women? And you know, if you're mad at women, goodness, you're mad at half the world. <laughs> and of course, this is true the other way around. What are men like? Brutes, or are they nice people? Can they be trusted or not? Are they people who exploit you, or are they people who care about you? What are women like? Nervous, miserable, selfish, demanding people? Or are women warm and friendly and comfortable and nice? So the first thing I want to say here is that when we talk about sex education of our children, we are talking about communicating an attitude toward the world. What are men like and what are women like? And how do you relate yourself to them? Now, when does sex education begin? And as I say, this is not something you sit down some afternoon and uh, get it over with. Um, we're not just talking about the physiology of the human body here. And just as evangelism must be caught rather than taught, I think it's obvious when you stop to think about it that the attitude that you have toward the opposite sex and your own is something that you absorb. It's something that is caught, not taught. And so when I think of sex education, I'm not only thinking about your attitude toward the opposite sex, I'm thinking about your attitude toward your own. Now, there's many a young man that I have consulted with, for instance, who has grown up with an attitude of rebelliousness and bitterness toward his dad. And so he finds himself becoming rebellious and bitter toward any man that's going to tell him what to do. And often a young man will have difficulty getting along at work because he simply can't be told what to do. And he will bristle at other men. And so sex education, as far as he is concerned, he came up through his family life with his guard up and his dukes up, his fists doubled up toward men, any man who would presume to tell him what to do. Don't cross me. So here's a young man who often has difficulty with teachers. He has difficulty with the coach, difficulty playing games because 
of his attitude toward all of men. So one of your responsibilities then as you raise your children from the very beginning to realize that as a man you probably have more impact on your son as far as getting across to him what a man is like than any other man. And many a young lady gets an idea of what men are like. All men. Simply because of her relationship to her own dad. Now I'm trying to say that this is a facet of sex education. Communicating an attitude toward mankind to your children. And how do you do it? It's caught, not taught. How does a woman treat a man? Well, the chances are that your daughter is going to get more cues about how a woman treats a man by how you treat your husband than any other way. What is marriage all about and what are husbands and wives supposed to do is something that is communicated, <coughs> maybe not deliberately, I say it's caught more than taught at your house. And if you want your daughter to be the ideal wife, the best way that I know of to teach it to her is for you to become the ideal wife. You mean become an ideal wife toward him? <laughs> well, if there's a price on you being a nice lady, I'll be nice to you under these conditions. One. Two, three, then don't be surprised if you find your daughter putting a price on her being nice. Does a woman dedicate herself to her husband or does a woman continuously just think about what am I getting out of this? What about a man when he comes home from work? Does he focus his attention on, on the family or does he become the center of attention? You know, quiet those kids down. I've had a hard day and I don't want anything to do with them now. Uh, you see what I mean? Do you become the center of attention when you, become, when you come home or you, do you become a servant? I'm saying that a lot that you get across to your children will be caught, not taught. As a counselor, I'm constantly amazed. When I get intimately involved in the story of an individual and then I meet that person's parents. And it's just a remarkable thing whether and often an individual is just like the parent he's mad at. He doesn't even realize how much like that parent he is. And so we have a responsibility here, first of all, when it comes to sex education, for us to, to strive to understand what manner of man we ought to be in God's sight. And understanding that, that we diligently seek to become that kind of person. And my wife and I, as we've gone through the years, it, be, it, it began to dawn on us that the way we go, the family goes. And we have realized that if we pay attention to our own relationship, my wife and me, and we are the kinds of people that we ought to be, then we can trust our judgment as far as the decisions are concerned having to do with our children. And the best way I know of for you to become an effective parent is for you and your partner to develop an effective relationship and beyond that you just do what comes natural. Because if you have developed a, a, an effective, happy, cooperative marriage. You 
are an unusual person. And don't hesitate to teach your children how you did it. Because there aren't very many people who have found the key to that. So rather than making sex education a very complex thing, I, I would just like to sum it up that fundamentally what we're talking about is uh, communicating to our children a relationship that we ourselves are living and that this will be caught more than taught. Now having said that much, I would like to talk about the specifics of sex education when it comes to boy-girl relationships. Lots of times in a group of students, high school students, I give people an opportunity to ask questions or write questions. And usually there's a standard question. What's wrong with petting? That's the question. What's wrong with petting? Now, how would you answer that? What's wrong with petting? Well, my answer to that is, as far as I'm concerned, there's nothing wrong with petting. It's my favorite pastime. <laughs> I can't think of anything that I would rather do. Would you buy that? <laughs> one of the most pleasant, one of the most satisfying of relationships, the physical expression between a man and a woman. It's great, isn't it? Oh, come on. You, you <laughs> You take such a proper attitude as though you don't even understand what I'm talking about. <laughs> I'm talking about kissing and hugging and fondling. And what's wrong with that? Now, the only question about it is timing. Maybe you feel a little better now. <laughs> but as far as pleasurableness is concerned, listen, your kids are going to swipe a kiss whether you like it or not. And if you say, now listen, don't you do that, that's bad. <laughs> that's terrible. And you're one of your children is going to sneak a kiss, and they're going to go, wow! <laughs> What's wrong with my dad? <laughs> he said this was terrible. This is awful. This is dirty. This is filthy. Now, oh, what a foolish approach to sex education. The dirtiness and the awfulness and the filthiness and the sinfulness of physical contact. And then these kids try it and they find out what, how, what a wonderful experience this is. Now, now, somebody's wrong. Somebody's just got to be wrong. You know, it says in the scriptures in the second chapter of Genesis, God created man. God did it. He created man in his own image, and in the image of God created he him, and male and female created he him. God did that. It was God's idea to make a woman. A woman's breast is God's idea. The female reproductive system is God's idea. Now, the female breast in the female reproductive system responds pleasantly to the touch, right? Do you know who thought of that? Do you know who designed that? God did. 
The male reproductive system is God's idea. The fact that the male reproductive organ has an erection and has very delicate, pleasant nerve endings, you know who thought of that? God did. Did he make a mistake? Now, he did some things that I wouldn't have done. He didn't ask me. <laughs> the human reproductive system doesn't develop all at once, and uh, some of the signals that the female is, that the reproductive system is developing, is ripe, is the fact that the breasts are beginning to develop the girl becomes more curvaceous, and girls are noticeable, aren't they? Haven't you noticed? <laughs> I can't understand you fellows. <clears throat> God made women so you can't miss them. <laughs> now, of course, when, we get, you, when you get to be your age, you learn to look at them without without uh, anybody realizing you're looking at them. <laughs> but you can't tell me that you don't see a pretty woman. And I'm not, I don't, I argue that I'm not an exception that when I walk down the street and bingo, there's a beauty. And there she is. I can't help it that God made them that way. There isn't anything wrong with enjoying the beauty of a woman. Or is there? Are we supposed to act like they aren't beautiful? Are we supposed to act like we don't notice them? You can't hand me that, buddy. Men notice women. And men are physically stimulated by what they see. And I'll tell you, in our day and age, that's stimulating. This is not unpleasant. This is pleasant. Oh, we go, <laughs> look at that girl. And we watch her as far as we can. <laughs> <laughs> can you imagine a girl dressing like that? Just look at that. And, and, and there's another one. Can you imagine? And so we look properly indignant. But nevertheless, we are well aware of the fact that a woman is mighty appealing to a man. And you women ought to be well aware of that. And this is God's idea. And I've talked in the consulting room to many a woman who wakes up to the fact that after she got married that the world of men did not disappear. And they are still there and they are still attractive. Now we're supposed to act like we are, not, we are suddenly now unaware of men. But you ladies know better than that. Now, God made us in such a way that we can respond physically to any woman. Not one woman, any woman. Well, not any woman, but many women. <laughs> And it isn't that bad a subject, is it? <laughs> and that does not change after marriage. Now, when we give our teenage young people the notion that their problem involving many people of the opposite sex will disappear after they're married, we are giving them an erroneous idea. As though you don't have a problem it's just these kids that do. And I know this, and so do you, some of you, that the more miserable you are, the more problem this becomes. Where your focus of attention can be aimed at somebody besides the one you married. Now, all through life, once the female reproductive system develops, 
there will be an awareness and a response to men. That's normal, natural, and it was God's idea. Now, there are some cues that tell us that the male's reproductive system has matured. Uh, all of us who have boys, we remember the day when their voice <laughs> changed and, and <clears throat> broke oh, once in a while. That's one of the cues. His shoulders begin to broaden. Uh, he starts getting hair in his chest and hair under his arms and hair between his legs. And we realize that the male reproductive system has matured. Now, this happens about 10 or 11 or 12 years old for the girls. And this happens when they begin to menstruate. And this happens at about oh, 12, 13 years old for the boys. And at that point, this girl has the capacity to become a mother. Now, I wouldn't give her that kind of opportunity, but God did. This boy has the capacity to become a father at that age. Now, I wouldn't give a kid the, the, the responsibility or the ability to become a father at that age. I wouldn't do it, but God did. Didn't he? And it was God's idea that there is a normal, natural, pleasurable response of a man toward a woman, physically. Sometimes your kids will discover this in church. You slide in a pew, and the other aisle down comes a girl, and, and here's your boy sitting next to a girl, and uh, you've got to share the songbook with her. And he touches her. Woo! So he sings away, all right. Uh, <laughs> but there she is. And he begins to discover the thrill of, and the joy and the pleasure of skin against skin. There isn't anything as pleasurable as skin against skin. Is there? Or anything as obnoxious if you're mad at each other. Now, you watch these kids. Here's a fellow starting to lead his girl around by the hand. And you wonder, what happened to her? I mean, she's gotten along okay. She knows where to go. She hasn't gotten lost. <laughs> and all of a sudden, this fellow leads her uh, down the church pew. Oh, you can't get lost going down a church pew. <laughs> But he's leading this girl by the hand. And not only that, he sits down and hangs on to her. Now, I don't know where he thinks she's going. Why does he do that? You don't. Or do you? Used to be fun. And you see these young people sit as close to each other as they can. Why? Because skin against skin is one of the most satisfying of feelings. And these young people have discovered this. You watch that fellow leading his girl around by the hand and pretty soon he's got his arm around her. Did you? That's one of the most uncomfortable ways there is to get anywhere. <laughs> I mean, if you want to get somewhere, uh, you free yourself. You don't wrap your arms around somebody else and try to stay. Why, why do they do that? because they discovered that the closer you can get, the more thrill there is. And then you watch these people sneaking off by themselves in the dark. Now, what can you do in the dark? <laughs> Troubles are like photographs. They are developed in dark places. And sitting for hours in a dark room or a parked car and kiss, kiss, kissing is ask, ask, asking for trouble. Prolonged kissing is the first step in serious lovemaking, and it whets the appetite, and it, 
It's meant to warm up, the, warm up the engines in preparation for a trip to the moon. That's what I said to my son when he went away to college. Son, keep those engines in neutral. <laughs> and he came back for his first vacation and he said, boy, dad, they won't stay in neutral. <laughs> He said, this is terrible. And I agreed. <laughs> said, boy, I know how you feel. It's a, really a rough period to go through. But just hold steady, boy. It, as much fun as it is, and as much thrill as it is to have a physical relationship with a girl. And I, I've never found it necessary to describe this as horrible and terrible and awful. I have found that, that uh, to be truthful and honest is to describe this as one of the highest and the finest and the most thrilling of all relationships, and that is sexual relations. It's so thrilling and so wonderful that it's just a shame to spoil it. And a few pleasurable moments that can ruin it for the rest of your life just isn't worth it. You say, it's, it's too good to wait. I say, that's right, it's so good, you better wait. And another year or more, and you'll have a lifetime of real joy and pleasure. Don't spoil it. But you can get yourself in a spot where, because of your physical involvement, you lose your reason, you lose your judgment, and you come to the conclusion that if I tingle all over like this around this girl, it's got to be the one. And I want to reassure you, my son, that you can tingle like that over a dozen women. And the fact that you tingle when you touch a woman doesn't mean anything except that you're a normal young man. But I've been in this counseling business long enough to know that there are people who say that this physical interplay between you and me is so wonderful, we've just got to get married and, and just imagine spending the rest of our lives enjoying this physical contact and if you do it at the cost of not paying any attention to what kind of person this is, and looking at your long-range goals, it isn't going to take you very long, and that person that made you tingle all over will just fill you with, you'll just despise her. I've had people tell me who just couldn't wait. In a few months, they're in a consulting room saying, I can't stand him even to touch me. Or I've had people say, the house isn't big enough for the two of us. These are the two people who seem to want to crawl inside of each other just a few months ago. And now, the house isn't big enough for the two of them. No, you don't get married on the basis of the fact that a man responds physically to a woman. Well, you can respond to a billboard. <laughs> These advertising people know that. Here's this pretty girl on this billboard. And then sure enough, after a while, you notice that beside her is a tractor. <laughs> and you see, that was the idea in the first place. Now, those fellows, they knew that you wouldn't see the tractor first. But if they put a pretty girl up there, the chances are you might notice the tractor. And all of us need to realize the normality and the naturalness of this physical contact. But we need to teach our children that this physical response is something that can happen between you and any one woman. Not only that, but when you get married, this response to women is not restricted to your wife. You don't lose your eyesight when you get married. Nor do you lose the normality of being responsive to other women after you get married. Now, what am I saying? I'm saying that the idea that we need to get across to our children 
is the fact that they have the responsibility of the stewardship of their body. God gave you that responsibility. Imagine God. It, ha it would have to be a God. Any man in his right mind wouldn't have done it. Imagine giving a 13-year-old girl the decision to make as to whether or not she's going to respond to a young man. And should she respond, she has the choice, the power to become a mother. Think of it, 13 years old. Oh my, what a responsibility. And I think this is the way we need to get it across, this wonderful, wonderful experience. God has given into your control at 13. Think of the trust. Think of the responsibility. Same way with a young man. God has given you the power to be a dad before you have the power to support a child. We need to get the idea of the stewardship of the body, the responsibility, the wonder of it all, the thrill of it all, the beautiful, thrilling prospect of it all. We've got to get this idea across to our children. It's, it's like, you know, kids want to drive a car long before they're able. And you don't let children drive a car because they want to drive a car. They've got to wait. They must, and many a man says, oh, I don't want to cause my child this suffering, and so I'm going to let him drive the car before he's ready. You think you're doing your child a favor? You know what you're doing? You're setting the stage for saying to your child, you just do what you want to do, son or daughter. Why wait? Go ahead and drive the car. There isn't anything wrong with cars, but it's a matter of timing. It's a matter of stewardship, trust. Take eating, for instance. There it is. You can indulge yourself there it is after all if i feel like eating why don't i why shouldn't i eat you realize what you're getting across to your children when you just eat because you feel like it you're getting the idea across if you feel like it do it Or you take the matter of impulsive spending. I, I, I was dealing with somebody just, just uh, within a couple of weeks who are hopelessly in debt. Why? Because when they want something, they go ahead and buy it. They'll worry about paying for it some other time. Why should you buy it? Because I want it. That's why I buy it. I want it. Now you teach your children to do what they want. And when they get to the place where their human reproductive system has matured and they find themselves a tingle, why should they wait? Why should they be frustrated? I want it. Why shouldn't I have it? In other words, the way a young man is going to approach a young girl is the way you have taught him to approach other things. And if you've taught him to care about other people, you've taught him to be considerate, and you've seen to it that he postpones doing things that he isn't entitled to, more than likely he'll approach a girl that way. He doesn't have to have everything just because he wants it. There are some things you have to wait for. And the same way with your daughters, when you teach your daughters to be considerate of somebody else, and uh, you teach your daughters that there are some things you just can't do right now. Oh, but no, our girls come along. I've got to wear makeup now. I've got to have a hairdo now. I've got to dress this way now. And you teach your children over a period of 13 years that they can have what they have now. And believe me, you're going to have some problems when it comes to dating because they want to do what they want to do when? Now. Where did they get the idea that you've got to have what you want now? They got it from you.
And we need to teach our children that there are some things that you don't do right now. I had a knockdown, drag out battle with my son for three years. Three years in high school. He wanted a car. His buddies had cars. They come tearing into our driveway with their cars. And I said to my son, you, you can drive our car. Uh, daddy's car. Poor kid, you know what he had to drive? A Roadmaster Buick. Now, is that any way to treat a kid? I'll tell you, he felt like one of the most mistreated people. But I told him, as far as I know, when I, when I look at your buddies and I look at their records in school, and when I look at the statistics, they all tell me that a high school kid doesn't need a car and you're not going to have one. But this is my money! But you're my responsibility and just because you have some money doesn't mean that you can just spend it any way you please your money you don't have the authority to spend your own money oh i tell you we had it over and over and over and over and over he would show me all kinds of illustrations of fellows who had their cars and i would show him all kinds of illustrations of the accidents and the statistics about why he shouldn't have a car and then it was time to go to college well now a college kid surely ought to be able to have a car <laughs> Uh, we'll see. And you see, during high school, Dick trained himself not to study. That was his goal. <laughs> <clears throat> and he was just smart enough to get by without doing it. And so when he went to college, naturally, he had this highly trained skill. <laughs> And he found out that uh, it was a little different at college, and so when the first grades came back, they didn't look too good. And when we discussed the matter of a car, it didn't make any sense at all for a fellow with those kind of grades to have a car. He just barely squeaked through that first year of college on probation and the second, and so on went the debate about the car. He didn't get a car all the way through college. This was an ongoing debate between us, but I just couldn't see the point. Now, I don't think he should have had one because he was too willful to have one. You say, well, how do you teach a fellow uh, dependability if you tie his hands like that? You teach a fellow dependability by example. And if he doesn't take your example, don't be foolish enough to think that you're going to teach him dependability by giving him what he wants. My son would say, don't you trust me? The answer was no. <laughs> I, I don't see any basis for trusting you. You want to be trusted? All right, I'll trust you. Earn it. Show it. Show me. Why, in the business world, you don't turn a business over to a fellow and say, here, do your best. You know, after all, you've got to learn. No, you turn him over to somebody that has a skill. And you teach him that skill by example. And then you let him, and then you give him some responsibility when you are satisfied that he will succeed. Now, this has been my philosophy, that you don't give an individual responsibility until you're pretty sure that he can succeed with it. Let me have my head and let me run around so that I can learn responsibility. I would say if your child is irresponsible, you'd better not let your child go out alone. I see lots and lots of girls come into my office, pretty kids, 16, 15. They come in like this. Oh, they had a lot of fun, though. Oh, they had the thrills. 
And I've listened to many a young child wail, how can something that was so beautiful turn out to be so horrible? And I've listened to mothers sit there and say, didn't I tell you that you were spending too much time with that boy? And I say to the mother, that's not enough to just shake your finger and say, didn't I tell you? You had better see to it that it doesn't happen. Well, I can't be with her every minute. If you can't trust her out of your sight, you better not let her out of your sight. We need to teach our children and give them a sense of stewardship of the body. And this child is a product of my loins. And therefore, this child is finally my responsibility. And it's my final choice what he does. And I'm saying that we need to teach our children something about obedience. And obedience often involves the fact that you can't do what you want to do right now. You've got to wait. If ever this idea of, of stewardship and responsibility is important, it's in this field of boy-girl relations. I hope I've made my point. How do you teach them responsibility? by your example. Well, let me finish this passage here. We were talking, remember, about revving up the engines? Who asked you to warm up the engines? I can't be more emphatic when I say keep away from tempting situations. Avoid overparking. You can get a ticket to some pretty unpleasant places. Double date. Don't invite them over when nobody's home. Stick with the gang on those beach parties. There is safety in numbers. Girls need to prove their love through illicit sex relations like a moose needs a hat rack. 